So please now welcome warmly the woman who dances to earthquakes and the man who is not dressed for good looking, but for good sounding. Moon Ribas and Neil Harbison. Well, Moon and I have known each other since we were children. We were friends when we were children, and we grew up together in Barcelona, so we shared the same context, we shared the same friends, and we finally shared the same university. But what we didn't share was the same perception of reality, because I was born with a rare visual condition called achromatopsia, which is total color blindness. And I was born just with normal vision, so I could see color perfectly well. So we shared the same context, but very different uh, perception. And I felt really beside her that she was a very, very new television. And I was like an old television set that could only see or perceive life in black and white. And this made me feel that Moon had extra senses, because she could perceive things that I couldn't perceive. He was asking me all the time the color of things, like the color of my dress, the color of the sky, the color of the book. So I, I felt like with extra senses and abilities. Yeah, because I really wanted to know the names of colors, and because it was so mysterious. And many people ask me, why would you like to perceive color? If you see in black and white, can you not just exist and live without color? And it's actually very, very difficult to ignore that color exists, because color is in, in very, very many places in society, in many contexts, uh, like yellow pages, Bluetooth, Greenpeace, Orange, Red Cross. You don't need to see color, but they contain color names that reminded me every single day of my life that color existed and that I couldn't ignore the existence of color. There's even things that have nothing to do with color, like a brownie, or, or James Brown, for example, it's a surname that contains a color, so I felt that I wanted to perceive all this uh, world. I felt socially excluded. There's even a whole country called Greenland, so, and it's probably not even green. So I felt that I wanted to understand better all this world that, that she could perceive and that the rest of you could perceive and I couldn't. Also, because when you use color as a code, it can be quite confusing, like hot water and cold water. You know automatically which one's which, but I need to test both waters, and I waste time and, and more water to know which one's which. Also, when you use color as a code, if I go to Sao Paulo, it's fine. I can just follow the lines. But if I go to Tokyo and the map is based on color, one can get very easily lost. So there are many strange of, uh, situations, daily situations, where color is actually necessary to understand uh, meaning like this one. So three different countries share exactly the same flag. So it made me feel a bit stupid when I didn't know the, the, the country of the flags. Also, when you use color to describe things, like if Moon asked me, have you seen the man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea, because I would only know that the man had hair, that he had eyes, and that he was not naked. So it was impossible to know if I had seen this person. So I tried to avoid color for a period of time, and I, I actually love the piano, because the piano is a black and white instrument. So I, I really liked and enjoyed music and playing the piano. But there I found out that there are also many theories relating color to sound. Even Newton started these theories about a relationship between each color and a note. And then there's been many other physicians and artists that have found a close relationship between color and sound. So this actually fascinated me a lot, because I could perceive sound. And I thought, well, maybe through sound, I can understand color. So I had my own color uh, scale, and I, I played the piano, and I felt that maybe each note was a color, but this wasn't really enough. So when I went to study at Dartington College of Arts, there was a lecture given by Adam Montandon 10 years ago about cybernetics and how we could use technology to extend our senses. And I was very interested in this subject because Adam was talking about how we could actually create new senses or wear a jacket that would feel you could feel if there is present behind. So I felt that maybe we could start a project to extend my own senses and a way, find a way to perceive color. So we started this project 10 years ago, and we created this first uh, electronic eye that allowed me to hear colors. We called it the eye bork, and it allowed me to hear the color frequencies in front of me. So red, 
if we could all hear red, we would hear a note between F and F sharp. So I heard this note, and then each color had its own note. So it's a transposition of light frequencies to sound frequencies. So it's like hearing the, the light spectrum, but 37, 38 octaves lower. So I started wearing this with headphones, a camera, and a five kilo computer every day of my life since 2004, but the iBook has evolved. And at the beginning, I just found it chaotic because there's color everywhere. So uh, I he heard so many different sounds and I had to memorize the name that you give to each color by the, the sound that I could hear. But after some time, this information became a perception. It was automatic. And then after time, some time, this perception became a feeling. I started to have favorite colors, and I started to actually also dreaming colors. So I started to hear colors in my dreams. Now, the aim was to perceive as many colors as possible. So after three years of wearing the electronic eye permanently, we kept upgrading the software until I got to 360 different notes for 360 different degrees of the color wheel. So I had different microtones for different shades of hue. So as you can hear, if you can put some volume and you might, is the sound output going here or? So there's different, uh, yeah. Now you can hear the different microtones. So I hear color like this, it's sine waves, pure sine waves and it's microtones. For example, from red to orange would be like going from F to F sharp. It's a semitone, and then it's divided in 30 different notes. So it's very microtonal. An octave has 360 notes. So there was a point when I was able to recognize all the 360 different hues. And um, this allowed me to perceive color just like you, but through sound. But there was another element of color that I couldn't perceive, which is saturation. I could perceive it was blue or yellow or orange, but I didn't know if it was a very vivid color or a dull color. So in 2007, we added with uh, Peter Kishe different levels of volume, depending on if the color is very uh, vivid or dull. So there's different levels for saturation, different hues, tones for to different notes for different hues, and then light I can see. So if I have a very bright pink, I might hear red. I'll hear, I'll, I'll hear the note F, so it's, I'll hear that it's red. But if I see that it's a light object, it means it's pink. And if I hear it very loud, it means it's a very bright or very vivid pink. So the eye work, I kept designing different uh, headsets that would actually adapt better to my head, because at the beginning it was a camera with headphones, and I couldn't find the, I was trying to find the best uh, design for my uh, electronic eye. So one of the first things I did was to cut the headphones in half because then I would ab be able to hear people and hear color because at the beginning <coughs> I was only hearing color. And then also one of the things I did was reduce the computer because uh, it, first it was five kilos, then it was three kilos, then it was two kilos. And I kept reducing. I was like losing weight. I felt like losing my own weight. Also the biggest change was to stop using headphones and to start using a uh, head, um, bone conduction, which is using the bone to hear the colors, and also to start using a chip. That was in 2010, when instead of using a computer, I started to use a chip, which is what I'm using now. So it's a chip attached at the back of my head, which is pressuring the bone, and then I hear color through bone conduction. Now, this is very, very, um, very important for me to hear color through bone conduction, because this means I have two audio inputs. I have air conduction for normal sounds and bone conduction for visual sounds. So this allows me to differentiate better what's a, a visual sound and what's a audio sound. Now the next step is to avoid or to stop this pressure to the bone and have the audio input inside the bone. So the operation has been approved and then I'll have like a mini jack entry in the bone. So I'll have a, a bigger difference between uh, bone conducted sounds and air conduction and then the next step is next year to start using my own body energy to charge the chip because now I still have to plug myself every four or five days and I want to use my own blood circulation to charge the chip so I don't need to depend anymore on electricity. <laughs> so in 2009, I felt that I could differentiate colors just as good as Moon and as, as everyone else. Actually, I felt I could actually differentiate color better than her. And, but I didn't know 
why I should stop mm, there. So I thought there's many, many more colors around us that we cannot perceive, like infrared and ultraviolet. So I decided to continue extending my color perception, and I included infrared and ultraviolet. So now I can actually perceive if there are any movement detectors in a room, because if there's infrared, I'll hear that there's infrared in a room. And also, perceiving ultraviolet, it's good to detect if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe, because if I hear that there's a lot of ultraviolet, then I won't go to the beach. And <coughs> <coughs> there was this point that Neil could actually perceive better color than me, and he had all this colorful experience. So I start to feel quite jealous, and I wanted to feel and to perceive uh, an experience like him. So I started to think what I could extend and how I could perceive the world differently. So I, I start to think and imagine that I actually could imagine a world in black and white, but I couldn't imagine a world with just color. So we invented those glasses that I could see just color without the shape. And I walk around with this, and we visited some capitals. And the problem is that I always had to hold Neil to walk around, because I couldn't see anything. I just had color perception. I was talking to people, and I didn't know the face. And yeah, these glasses were created with kaleidoscopic vision. And then there's this kind of antenna to balance the weight. So after a, a while uh, wearing this, I realized that I, was, I wasn't actually extending my senses. I was reducing them, which it didn't make any sense to me. So I start to think of creating something more personal. And I studied choreography, so I want to dedicate um, myself to movement and to be a movement researcher. So I was thinking just with myself and my human being in the world, and yeah, uh, we then we developed the uh, speed work, which uh, helped me to detect the, um, the speed of the people walking in front of me. So I had this attached to my wrist, and this machine helped me to, yeah, to detect the, the speed of the people walking. But then I felt that this was quite distant to my body. I wanted to have something more integrated. So we, we did this uh, speed work to the earrings, so those earrings were made to the um, um, infra infrared sensors. And every time the infrared detected the movement, it made a vibration on my ears. So it depends on the interval of each vibration, I could know the speed of the walking people around me. The good thing about this and the interesting part is that I could perceive movement without looking. Because if I close my eyes, I could see if the people were walking around me. And the nice thing is also that if I turn my ears backwards, I could feel movement behind me, which uh, I think it's quite useful because when you walk in a hurry in the street and there's like always oh, someone blocking you and you cannot pass over, it's because no one is aware of what they have in their back. All the sensors of uh, the humans are just in front and, and all our backs are always like uh, sleeping. So I think everyone should have a, a detector on the back. Well, this is like, like this, to feel if someone comes um, uh, Yeah, it's behind. strange that we actually add these sensors to machines, but we don't add them to humans. There's the cars now can detect yeah. if there's a car behind, but we are giving this new sense to cars, and we're not actually giving it to ourselves. So it's actually exciting if we also try it, and we can actually extend our senses to uh, what would be a 360-degree perception of of our surroundings. And after wearing this while, I, I had this need to perceive something more, more global, something more universal, something that it connect myself more to the earth and to the planet where we live. So I start to imagine, well, and then I realized that the earth move for, has its own movements, that every three or five minutes, there's like a small earthquakes in the earth. Even they're so small that no one can notice, but the earth shows, um, keeps moving. It's like the earth keeps dancing and we don't realize. And then it was one day like, imagine if I could just stand here in Berlin 
talking and then noticing that there's earthquakes in somewhere in California or there's little earthquakes in Alaska or in China. Wouldn't that be amazing? So we start this, this project, it's called the Seismic Sense. So now I have a sensor attached to my wrist that it's connected to an uh, online seismograph that detect uh, when there's real-time earthquakes on Earth. So I keep feeling the, the real-time earthquakes on the Earth. From one in the Richter scale and then mm. it keeps going up. And it, it's a sense that can actually, it's just starting now, but it can actually be developed so that in the future you might be able to feel exactly where the earthquake is taking place. And, and now the depending on the intensity as well, you know what degree of the of this Richter scale uh, um, you're feeling. Yeah, maybe I can detect the patterns on the Earth that where the earthquakes are happening and maybe in the future predict them also. And well, yeah. with our extended sensors, we've developed art projects because that's what we really enjoy doing is to express ourselves through these new sensors. One of the projects we did was to travel around Europe and uh, Moon was wearing the speedboard and I, I was listening to the colors and I walked around the city trying to detect the dominant color of a city because uh, when I was a child, I thought that cities were gray, but since I hear color, I, did, I know that it's completely false. Each city has a dominant or two dominant colors, so I scan the cities and then I try to detect the dominant colors. Yeah, we wanted to, to create a dictionary, and well, we would like to, to describe cities in a different way. So we wanted to create a dictionary that defines each, each city for its movement and for its color, so they have a different uh, experience of the city. So what we're seeing now is Moon is walking at the average speed of Lisbon and what you hear are the two dominant colors of Lisbon which is light yellow and turquoise. Yeah, doing this research uh, I, I realized that the fastest cities is London and it's Stockholm, it's actually quite fast and, there's, and the slowest is the Vatican City. And I guess the cities with the strangest colors I've detected is maybe Andorra, which has a, a slight uh, purple color. And maybe an interesting one is also Belgrade, which has uh, two shades of orange and rust orange. So this is one of the projects. Also, my daily life and has changed and actually now moons as well because now we try to dress in a way not that it looks good but in a way that it sounds good so depending on the day i might wear c major d major or an e minor depending on how i feel so this would be a c major outfit this would be a d d major and here i would be wearing a, a song actually and uh I'm actually wearing Moon River song to make, um, I'll show you. So this is um, like one of the first sonochromatic dresses we made. So we, from the top to the bottom, you can scan it and you can hear Moon River. It's because she's called Moon Rivers. And, and it's it like a <laughs> <laughs> song. One of the latest uh, things we create is this tie that sounds like music by Sega Bodega. Sometimes I wear it and it sounds very electronic, so... This is the sound of my tie. If I feel very excited, I might wear this uh, one day. Uh, parting. Uh, parting, maybe, yeah. <laughs> also, the way I perceive food has changed because now I can actually compose music with food. And I really enjoy this now. So I just, depending on what I have on the plate, I just distribute the food in a way that I, then I can eat a song. So the also, it, well, it, it's create a menu with a sounds. menu. We've tried to create this menu where you can actually uh, go to a restaurant and then choose if you want to eat some maybe 
I don't know, Imagine by John Lennon as a first plate, and then you can have some Mozart as a main dish, and then some Lady Gaga dessert. So you can actually choose your songs, and then you can not, you don't know what it will taste like, but it will at least sound like your music. Maybe this would help the children to eat more their vegetables if they knew that they would be eating Justin Bieber songs. Yeah, so we are trying to create this as a menu, but also an exciting thing is just to create music with objects or with fruit and vegetables and things that I find in supermarkets because now supermarkets are a place where I go to find music notes. So it's like a music store and each aisle has electronic music because if I just walk around, I can hear the different notes. So it's a very, very exciting place to go because when people ask me, which places do you enjoy? People expect me to say that I will enjoy going to the forest or to the sea, but it's actually supermarkets that I really, really enjoy because the light is perfect, it's white light, and there's so many colors. Uh, you can find many, many different hues. So, this is some music. Because forests, they're usually microtonal, so it's like the same. Mm. Milk is silent. <laughs> Milk doesn't sound because it's white, so any element that it's white or black or pure gray will not sound. So it's sometimes really difficult because, for example, this now many people would say that this is white, but you are not actually seeing this as white. You are seeing a very light yellow white because the, the light is not white. So uh, it, 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 it's really difficult now to perceive white or pure gray because it's almost impossible to perceive. There's always some kind of hue. We also create this video dance piece that it's based on the, on the supermarket perception that Neil has. So the music of this video is made through the colors that keep appearing. You will see it afterwards. And the nice thing is that the choreographical uh, sequence of this video keeps changing because of the objects. We did this because uh, when I go to the cinema or when I watch a film, uh, the images, if they have color, they already have background music. So when there's already a background music, then I have like two musics. So I thought, why, why don't we create a video creation that contains the sound of the colors so that you don't need to create a, a music. You can just use the, the sound of the video. So this is just rhythm created from the notes, the colors that appear on the on a video. That's a green pepper, I think. There's a different shade of green. The, the rhythm is made by Neil. He doesn't usually hear it that way. No? I hear mm -hmm. color as a continuous sound, but then what I do is just create rhythms. And uh, we actually gonna give a co color concert at seven or a quarter to seven at stage two, where we'll create music from colors and uh, maybe from your faces. I might be do the, doing this. So, well, we can. So this goes on and on until Moon can can't even dance because she's wearing too many uh, objects. Well, my perception of supermarkets. Oh, thank you. So art has also changed because now I can actually hear the scream, for example, or I can hear a Picasso because uh, art museums has, have become like music halls as well because I can hear paintings. Uh, painters have become composers. So I have a completely different experience of art before it was just visual to me. Now it's music. So, for example, Andy Warhol, you can really know if you have an Andy Warhol in front of you because it usually sounds very loud and with very specific colors. Whereas more classical paintings sound less because they are less saturated and with many microtones. So it has n not only changed the way I perceive supermarkets, but also museums and, and, and art itself. Also, the way I perceive faces it has completely changed because now each face has a sound. So what I really enjoy doing is sound portraits. Instead of drawing someone's face, I just get close and then I, I listen to the color of the eyes, the lips, the skin, and the, the hair, 
and then I write down the different notes, and this creates a specific sound uh, portrait of, of faces. One of the first ones was Prince Charles, and uh, he sounded very musical because he has so many colors. He has uh, his uh, eyebrows sound different from his eyes. Actually, his left eye and his uh, right eye sound different as well, so he, he sounds a lot. So I create these sound portraits, and then you can also create music with faces, so you keep adding rhythms and uh, different layers of sound, and each face, face sounds uh, unique. I've tried twins, and twins also sound different. And also, many, many more people have this slight difference between the left eye and the right eye. Most people think that their eyes are blue or they are green, but they actually, if you look close, you'll see that there's always a slight difference. And this is what I detect, and then I transpose to sound so that people can hear their own face. There's people using the, the sound of their face as their ringtone. So these are the five notes, and then I uh, join them together and create this chord, which is the unique chord for each phase. It's a, here we can hear the all all them to, all together. This actually allows me to give face concerts as well. So uh, instead of playing an instrument, the audience cue, and then I plug the the eye to loudspeakers, and then I keep playing people's faces by adding rhythms and and different layers. And if the concert sounds terrible, it's always the audience's fault because I'm picking up the colors from the audience. So. I think later at stage two, we'll actually create a face concert. So anyone that wants to participate will be playing uh, faces so we can create the, uh, music from the colors. What really s struck me was that humans are not black and white, which is something I also learned as a child. I thought that black people were black and, we were, and I was white, but it's uh, completely false. My skin is not white and black people's skin is not black. Uh, black skins are very, very, very dark orange, and white skins are very, very, very light orange. So what really varies is the, the hue. So it can be very, uh, like, um, uh, can be a yellowish orange or a, a reddish orange, and then what varies is the light. But we are never black or, or white. This is the human color wheel. It, it detects the different hues in, in the skins that I've listened to since 2004. Well, Neil had some secondary effects while when, when he was wearing the eye work. So when he picks up the phone, the, the line, the sound that you can hear in the phone for him is green. So always he always relates telephones with the color green. Or for example, the fridge in our apartment, it always sounds purple. So he had to paint the fridge purple. Just yeah, because it was it annoying me, because it, sou it sounded purple, but it was white. So I, we just <laughs> painted it purple so that it made sense. But it started to happen with more and more things. <laughs> it started to happen with, uh, with music as well. So I went to a concert, we went to a concert, and I thought, wow, each note has a color, because I, I felt that each note that the singer was singing had a, a, a color, so I could, I could relate the music to color. So I, I decided to start painting music which is note by note, I just transpose what I hear to color. So I, I just try to find the same sound on the palette or on the Photoshop until it sounds the same. And then I can create music by, with, with paintings. This is uh, Mozart's Queen of the Night. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, which is strange because uh, many people say, wow, it's strange because it's pink, but it's, it's, it's I, I didn't decide it, but it's actually pink, which... Yeah, we might think that maybe there's a real relation with sound and color that we still have to discover. Yeah, because when you transpose the four seasons of Vivaldi into color, most people guess which one's which, when mm. there's no way, uh, there's no uh, subjectivity in this. It's just a transposition of uh, light to color, so it's uh, strange that most people can detect which, is the, which season is which. Also, I've transposed voice to color because when we speak, we are using different frequencies, and these frequencies also relate to color. So these are two speeches. One of them is uh, a speech by Hitler, and the other one is a speech by Martin Luther King. They are very different speeches. One of them is, I have a dream. And yeah, most people think that Hitler is the one on the left, but it's actually the one on the right. 
the most colorful one is Hitler's because he used many different frequencies in a very small amount of time. So this is transposed to color and it gives a, a very large variety of color. Whereas Martin Luther King's speech of I have a dream is always between C and E. His voice was always between C and E, so the result is a very bluish pink and uh, purple uh, uh, painting. So this is a sock sonata, because now I can give concerts with uh, objects or with, um, with uh, any colorful elements. So I give color concerts, and this is what we'll do the afterwards with faces. Yeah, and this is the piece that I will also show afterwards, that it's called Waiting for Earthquakes. It is about the, the audience and the performer, in this case me, are waiting to, for earthquakes to take place. And when an earthquake is happening, the dancer moves to the point, to the right point of the, of the stage, marking south, uh, north, south, east and west, and moves in with the intensity uh, of the earthquake that just happened. So this piece could last for, for hours and even days and weeks with the rotation of the dancers. <coughs> There's no beginning or end, and the good thing is that it's always different because it always depends on the earthquake, earthquakes that are happening. So if there are no earthquakes, there will be no dance, which is something that might not like an audience, maybe if, if they've paid for an entry and then she doesn't dance that, because there's no earthquakes. This is but the only condition. Fault, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are earthquakes every four or five minutes, so in theory, it should always, there should always be dance. Yeah, and in 2010, we decided to start the Cyborg Foundation because we re received so many emails of the people interested in extending their senses and becoming a cyborg. And we uh, founded the Cyborg Foundation with three aims. The one was to help people to become a cyborg. The second was to defend the cyborg rights. And the third one is to promote the cyborgism, which is the, a social and art movement uh, that um, extend the, the extent the, the people, the, the senses the of people. Senses of so people. cyborgism can actually be an art movement where artists not only use their senses, but they create new senses through the union between cybernetics and their own body, and then they create new art through these new senses. So it's uh, not only a social movement, but we see it mostly as, a, an, as an art movement. What do we believe a cyborg is? is, is, uh, is very, to us, is a, a very personal, uh, relationship with cybernetics. In my case, I feel that uh, I only felt like a cyborg when I really felt that cybernetics were a part of my organism. And this happened after months of wearing the electronic eye. It wasn't an automatic feeling. I didn't feel like a cyborg when I uh, started to hear colors. I started to feel this strong union between cybernetics and my body when I started to dream in color, when it was my brain creating electronic sounds in my dreams. It wasn't the software, but my brain. And it was when I couldn't really feel the difference between the software and my brain. I feel that the electronic eye is now an extension of my senses, an extension of my brain, and a part of my body. This is my brain with an MRI scan, and they are here they are showing me a black and white image of the sky. And then what happens when I look at a black and white image of the sky is that my brain automatically creates the sound C sharp because I'm so used to hearing C sharp when I look at the sky that my brain automatically gives me the color. It also happens if they showed me uh, oranges that I would create F sharp. And this is exactly what happens to my brain when I dream that my brain creates sound because I'm so used to hearing color. Now, I had a problem in 2004 because uh, I wasn't allowed to renew my passport because uh, there's a law that says that you're not allowed to appear on passport photos with any electronic equipment. So I wrote back to them and I told them that what they were seeing was no longer an electronic equipment, but a part of my body, an extension of my senses, that I felt that this was me and a part of me. So uh, I wrote to them and then they replied saying that this was not a, a good uh, reason, well, that I would need a letter from my, my doctor. So I went to the doctor and the doctor wrote a letter explaining how I felt and that I wore it permanently and that I felt it was an extension of my senses. So at the same time, they finally accepted, which is, which is really good because now I can actually travel around the world with the electronic eye. No one can actually force me to take off the eye because it's a part of my official image. 
And this is, it, there's many, many situations where people don't like the fact that I'm wearing an electronic uh, element. Many people think that I'm filming or I'm doing something illegal. I was in Venice for some days detecting the color. People thought I was from Google View because I thought I was filming for the, for the Google View. So people start thinking that I'm actually doing things that I'm not. So just from yesterday, a friend from Berlin created this. From Iceland. He created this that says, I'm not filming. So <laughs> I might be wearing this around because it actually does help. <laughs> so it really creates uncomfortable situations because uh, people just are very, very afraid of the fact that I might be filming them. So uh, having it in the past will at least give some proof. Um, Moon also has it. Yeah, I went to the Spanish department and I also wear the earrings and I could renew my passport, I guess. So it was small. So she can actually also travel with mm -hmm. her uh, cybernetic extension, though th this has changed now. And I also, also renew my passport photo because my eye has evolved since 2004. But it's like having a, an old haircut or something that you, you can't really ask for, for a change. This is some project that we're doing in the Saban Foundation. This uh, with the ear, ear work, we did the opposite that the eye work does. It's like we transposed songs to to color, so we could do like uh, concerts for deaf people. It would look like this. So it detects the dominant frequency of the concert and then it transposes it to color. So if you, know, you can also have a microphone with a small screen so that if you want to sing A, you need to sing until you see the color green. If you want to sing C sharp, you need to sing until you see blue. So this would really be useful for Moon because she really doesn't tune very well. So it would actually help her tune better if, if she can uh, see the color that she's singing. Also, the, um, it allows you to see the pitch in which someone is talking to you. So I if, have a dream. if someone has a very high pitch voice, you can see it by the Even color. The so you can also give an extra perception to deaf people or to anyone that wants to perceive the color of voice life. These are projects mm -hmm. we've done with blind people. We've given, uh, well, with all these cybernetic extensions are open and free and anyone that wants to create an eyeborg, they can find it out on the website and we help people create their own electronic eyes. We don't sell electronic eyes or we don't sell cybernetic extensions. We want people to create them at home or to learn how to create them or to just Even experience. improve them or change them. So mm -hmm. here is with blind people and they, their, their experience can be quite different because uh, there are blind people that used to see color when they were children. So telling them that that sound is red and that sound is blue actually activates their memory and they can actually remember and revisualize the color. So when you put blue in front of a blind person that used to see blue and you tell them whenever you hear this sound, it's going to be blue, then they can start seeing the color that they used to see. So it has a different effect from, from me and from it would have a different effect from someone that sees color because it would also have maybe a psychedelic effect. And they learn the colors so much faster than, than the other people. It was amazing. Yeah, in this case, we, we, with a cup of coffee, after the, after the end of the coffee, they could differentiate blue from green, from yellow, from red, which are basic colors. So it, it's, it's quite fascinating with mm. the blind people. This is another project that a friend of us were, had a, a finger missing. And we were said, well, with this space that you have in the hand, what we could do? And first he wanted to, to have a scale. Well, we thought of different options because he had this extra space. So he could use a new finger to have some kind of extra uh, feeling or ability. So he actually, we thought and we didn't know what, but we thought maybe a scale, maybe if you have something and then it would tell you the exact weight of anything you have on your hand. But this wasn't really useful for him, he thought. And then we thought, well, uh, are you a smoker? Because maybe you could have a lighter, but this, he's, he doesn't yeah. smoke. So maybe a light or just to have some light. But then he said he was studying film and uh, he was studying actually audio media. So he thought that maybe something related to cameras. So we just added a small miniature camera that allows him to take pictures and film with his own hand. But this project is still not finished because we want him to have some kind of feedback because now he's, ju he's just wearing a, a as camera. As a tool, but not as a sense. Yeah, so no. we're still working on this so that he can actually feel something and maybe perceive something extra. And this is the internal compass that we, we also creating to have something in your ankle 
and whatever you face north, they, it has a it makes a vibration on your ankle, so you know how to orientate very well in the space. So this can help orientate yourself when when you are in uh, in a new city or in a forest, or when there's no sun, because many people are oriented by the sun. But with this, you can actually know where the north is. We're also working on internal light. So there's many people that have teeth or tooth or tooth missing. So why not replace this tooth? with something that can actually give you something else or something more. So we're creating this uh, tooth that had, has a, a small lead inside so that when you click, you have light. So in case in total darkness, you can just open your mouth. Well, most of these senses that we've talked about and that we are excited on extending are senses that already exist in nature. So we are very, very much inspired by animals and animal senses, and we feel that becoming a cyborg or using technology as part of the body is not actually becoming more like a machine, is not actually becoming less human, but it's actually giving us the chance to perceive reality to the level of other animal species and to get closer to the animal kingdom. It allows us to, to feel nature in a greater way. So for yeah, example, for yeah. example uh, Neil hears like the dolphin because dolphins can hear through bone conduction. So hearing color through bone conduction makes me feel closer to dolphins because they can actually hear through, through bone conduction. And reindeers can perceive the ultraviolet. So perceiving ultraviolet like many insects or birds, it makes me feel also closer to mm -hmm. other animals. Um, How I am Bob Till Squid, he, uh, he can make light inside the water. So having Tooth, a tooth that has light is something that already happens in nature. There's animals that can create light when they are in total darkness, so it, it could also help us see when we are in darkness. He creates uh, electrical, uh, electrical fields. So platypus, he can detect platypus. electrical fields. Um, this and and this, this frog is quite amazing. He freezes. Uh, freezes when the winter comes, but on the whole body, like the, all the organs, even the heart is frozen, and he's, she's like nearly dead. But then when the spring comes and the sun starts to, to shine, uh, they recover again, and all the, um, all the organs, they freeze, and they are again alive. We are not so suggesting us to, to freeze in winter. We're just, just uh, <laughs> trying it's to... Just, yeah, to explain it... Uh, there's no superpowers, and actually nature has already all these senses that we feel that they're so, so incredible. And actually this jellyfish uh, is immortal, so immortality already exists in nature. So we are very inspired by, uh, by nature, not by science fiction, and we feel closer to nature and not so much to all these um, talk about becoming super... Uh, human or becoming or having superpowers. What we want really is to try to experience life and nature to the level of other animal species. I, and we uh, also think that we, we as a humans haven't been able to adapt very well to Earth. We have to build streets and we had to build buildings to be able to live more comfortable. And actually feeling the earthquakes, um, now it's something really bad when a big earthquake is, is, is happening. But it, sh it could be something enjoyable. When the earth moves, everyone could enjoy. But because we've built like uh, cities that are not adapted to, to the planet, then s the earthquakes are bad. But it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, so earthquakes are, are not actually the catastrophe. The catastrophe is that humans have not been able to adapt to, the, to Earth yet. The word cyborg was created so that humans could adapt and survive in space. But we feel that we still need to survive and be able to experience Earth itself. So I think we, we should all try to at least experiment some kind of cybernetic or sensory extension because there's so much that we cannot perceive and that we could actually perceive now during our generation. It's the first time when human evolution doesn't need to wait. I mean, we can evolve during our lifetime. We can evolve to the direction that we want. And there's so many options right now that we could all start trying out. So we, we really encourage you to think about which sensory extension you'd like to do and to just experiment for a few months or maybe forever having this extra sense. Thank you very much. Thank you.
थैंक यू थैंक यू